Earlier this week, our, our new general superintendent, Dr. Wayne Schmidt, wrote uh, the following. He said, the first full week of July 2016 was one marked by violence in our headlines and across our screens in the United States. The first wave of violence involved two black men who were shot during what started as more routine encounters with local police. The sub subsequent peaceful protests were interrupted by gunfire striking nearly a dozen officers, senseless, senselessly killing five in a violent act full of tragedy and irony considering it was an anti-violence protest. And even since he wrote this, this week, there was the mass killing in France and the political uprising in Turkey where hundreds of people were killed in political unrest. And as we live in this kind of a world, this is not a world, if you've lived in America very long, this is not a, a kind of environment that we are used to living in in the United States of America. And, and the question comes, if, if the Bible means anything to us this morning, the question comes, what are we to do? And how are we to respond in times like these? These events sometimes seem far away, and uh, they seem uh, to be so unrealistic uh, in comparison to the lives that we live. But the reality is the church of Jesus Christ is called to exist in these kinds of times. And you and I, whether we like it or not, God has chosen us to be the church today. You might say, well, I liked it better in the 70s. Well, that's nice, but God chose for it to be 2016. He doesn't give us the option to be 1976. You know, it's, we, we, live, we live today and we must minister today. So the question is, what are we to do and how do we respond in times like these? Well, the writer of Hebrews is addressing Jewish believers who lived under the rule of the Roman Empire. They actually had this kind of situation and, and persecution for quite a number of years. And he recalled their earlier days of persecution as Christ followers in Hebrews 10, 33, and 34. He writes to those individuals, and he says, Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Let me say that again. You joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Wow. These people had the Holy Spirit living in them. I don't, I, well, I was going to say I don't think. I know I'm not there yet, and I doubt there's very many in this room that are at the point where if because of your faith, your property was confiscated from you, and you would be joyful. But that's what the Hebrew writer said to these people here. Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. For the people who have experienced such difficulties, the Hebrew writer pointed them to their great high priest, Jesus Christ. And that's where we want to go this morning. This is what we've been talking about in, uh, uh, in our study in Hebrews. In Hebrews 10, 19 to 21, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. And then he goes on and talks to us about what we're going to share in the message this morning. But in the midst of all of this, while, while we are, are just terrorized by what happens in, in our world, and, and we are shocked, and, and we are heartbroken, the, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that we need to remember that we have a great high priest, you see, the leaders of this world and the terrorists of this world and people who are filled with hate are not in control. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our great high priest, is in control of all things. In the turmoil of terrorism, violence, 
and divisive presidential campaigns, we must remember that we have a great high priest. The, writers, the Hebrew writer's advice to those early Jewish believers is very applicable in these times. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ, for church follower, or for Christ followers to get real about their faith. Our faith is not something we practice for an hour or two on Sunday morning. We need to get real about our faith. And so, as we continue our sermon series from Hebrew, entitled, Revealed, A Glimpse of God, the message this morning is getting real. No scripture, nothing that is taking place today is more applicable than this passage of Scripture for us after the last two weeks of what we've experienced in our world and wishy-washy, name-only kind of religion is not sufficient. We need to get real about Jesus Christ and living for Him and following after Him in these days. Well, the first thing that the Hebrew writer tells us, is that we are to respond in unity. Respond in unity. In that um, message that our general superintendent wrote, he referred to uh, Troy Evans, a a friend of, of the general superintendent's. He's also a friend of ours. Troy has been here to our church. He spoke to us a couple years ago at our Missional Holiness Conference. And he wrote um, about the tragedies of last week, referring to the, the racial uh, tensions that, that we're uh, are experiencing. And, and Troy writes this. By the way, he's a, he's a black pastor. He pastors a hip-hop church in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Troy said this, Many are looking for the answer. The answer is a slow-burning one. It's one relationship at a time. Who's sitting at your dining room table when your news feed is not filled with these types of issues? So that when these types of issues come up, you can have the real convo with a real friend. Dr. Schmidt added, this is important to us. Rather than easy, quick answers, we can seek long, faithful friendships across ethnic lines. Nothing will make us healthier in the face of these challenges than those trusting friendships. And so as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to develop friendships with people who are not like us, who who perhaps don't look like us. If you look around the room, we are majority white, but we do not want to be a white church. We want to be a church where everyone is welcome and everyone is loved and everyone is accepted and that we help them, uh, if they don't know Christ, to come to Christ. And so the Hebrew writer, in that kind of spirit of unity, he writes in giving us a list of, of responses to our great high priest. He says, since we have such a great high priest, let us. Okay? Now, he didn't say let you. And in the Greek language, there is a, 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 a singular form for you and a plural form. When we say you, we might be talking to an individual or we can talk to a group. But in the Greek, it was, it was set out. But he didn't even use the plural form of you. He said, let us. It, it's plural. It, it includes all of us. He wasn't talking to just the Hebrew people that he was writing to. He wasn't talking to just a a particular era in time. He was saying, let us. So these are exercises that we must do together. These are responses that we must do together as the body of Christ. He's talking to his church. He's talking to, to the people of God. And he says, let us. And so in these days of wickedness and turmoil and, and, and terror and, and uh, violence, let us, in light of the fact that we have such a great high priest, let us draw near to God. 
In Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Collectively, as the people of God, we need to draw near to God. And you know, as we draw near to God, we will be closer to one another. But this isn't just getting alone in your prayer closet and praying, and there's a place for that, and Jesus talks about that. It's not just having your private devotions at home or at work or wherever you have the time for the devotions, but this is the people of God coming together, and and the Hebrew writer says, let us draw near to God. And and I I think it's, it's not being judgmental or stretching our imagination to realize that over the last 30, 40, 50 years, the church itself is not as near to God as we ought to be. We come, we gather, we worship, and we leave. But are we really living lives where we are really close to God as a people? Then he also says, let us hold unswervingly to hope. In in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. You you see, in the world, when something goes wrong, they panic. Uh, When they're not sure about the future, they wring their hands. When when things are in turmoil, we, we don't know what to do. But as the church of Jesus Christ, the Hebrew writer says, since we have such a great high priest, let's hold on to the hope that we have. There's nothing that this world needs to see from the church more than to see that we're not panicked, that we are holding on to God together as the people of God. Let us hold unswervingly to hope. And then he says, spur one another on. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and deeds. We're Americans. Most, most everybody here is a, was American. We might have been born in America or we've been in America for a long time. And Americans love independence. We just this month celebrated Independence Day. And, and a lot of people like to say, I can do it myself. I, I want to be independent. I don't want to have to depend on anybody else. But when it comes to our faith in Jesus Christ, we need to, to depend on one another. We need to come together and be interdependent. And the writer of Hebrews here is saying, we need to spur one another on. Faith is not just a private issue. It's not something that we just keep to ourselves. But if we see someone that... that uh, maybe used to be involved and they're not anymore. Maybe they used to be in leadership and they're not anymore. Maybe they they used to teach and they they, they don't anymore. They, they, They just seem to be falling back away. We need to go alongside that person and spur them on and remind them, the church needs you. You need the church. Uh, We are a body, and and we need to encourage one another. And this is one of the ways that small groups uh, work, to to help one another. And really, this whole thing, this whole package that he's saying, let us, let us, let us, let us, is all about getting together in small groups. Because for an hour on Sunday morning, that's very limited, our ability to do these things. But but don't just say, oh, well, you know, I've always admired that person in the past, and I don't want to go up to them and and kind of spur them on to good works. But that's what the Hebrew writer, the Bible, the Word of God, the Spirit-inspired Word of God tells us to do. We are to spur one another on. Now, a spur doesn't seem like a very nice word. I mean, it's kind of what cowboys wear on their boots, and they kind of dig it into the sides of their horses when they want to get them going. And so sometimes we just need to be a spur in somebody's saddle and get them moving in serving the Lord. We shouldn't be satisfied for people to be inactive in the work of God. And then he says, let us meet together faithfully in uh, Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. He gives us two areas of let us in this one verse. And, uh, and, and, and so we see the, the importance of this. this that, let us not give up meeting together. And again, this is not just on Sunday mornings. 
This is getting together in small groups where we can learn to know one another more personally. Uh, I, as the pastor of this church, I have a hard time just keeping up with everyone's name, let alone knowing everything that's going on in, in, in their lives. And, and so we may not learn to know everybody real well, but we ought to get together in small groups where we do know a few people real well that we can encourage them along the pathway. So we're not only supposed to be a spur. There are some people that are spurs, and they just like to dig their spur in into others. But we're to encourage one another as well. When, when we see somebody that needs encouragement, somebody that's down, or we know that someone went through a difficult situation, we need to encourage them. Uh, the Wegford family this summer, uh, after the um, war room small groups that we had, are keeping their small group going every other week this summer. And there's a lady that doesn't live very far from us. Her name is Kathleen. She started coming Easter weekend to church, and she wants to come to this church. She even came to our Connect group one Sunday afternoon, but she can't continue to come because she works on Sundays. And so the only connection that she has to keep her involved in this church is going over to the Wakefords' home. They are the church for her during the week. And, and, and that's what we need to do until September, and then they'll have two opportunities. People that work Sunday morning can come Saturday night. But this is, what, this is the kind of, of uh, setting that the Hebrew writer is talking about. He's saying, let us get together. Let us encourage one another. Let us spur one another on to good works. Let us keep the banner of hope held high in this world. Let's do these things together as the church of Jesus Christ. The second thing that he says is to stand tall fearlessly. Stand tall fearlessly. We talked earlier about persecution. And by and large in America, we don't know what persecution is except what we read about what's happening to other people. But we certainly must say that over the last several years, Christianity has not been as loved and accepted in our culture as it once was. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. The people that he wrote to went through persecution. But it was through the times of persecution that they were able to let their light shine the brightest. And because of their faithfulness and persecution, we have the church today. We have the word of God today. We have all the blessings that we know about because of those early Christians who were faithful in persecution. And just because we may go through a, a time of persecution doesn't mean that the world is coming to an end. It's simply means that it's our turn to be persecuted, and we need to have the faith to stand tall. And, and the Hebrew writer tells us some of the things that we need to stand tall in. We need to stand tall in resisting sin. In Hebrews 10, 26, and 27, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You see, there, there was a time in the United States, not too many decades ago, that just going to church seemed to get people by. Now, they may have gone to church because their spouse insisted they go. They may have gone to church for their children's sake or because their parents made them go. They may have thought, hey, this is a good thing for my reputation in the business world. I, I can say I go to church and everybody will love me and you know, buy stuff from me because I, I'm a Christian. Or Some people even want to use the church as a way of selling stuff right in, in the church. You know? and, and, and for decades, it seemed like we got away with that. But I want to tell you this morning, that kind of religion that kind of religiosity will not get us through the kinds of days that we're in and the days that are coming in the United States of America. We need to stand tall in resisting sin. We need to go deep with God so that as the persecution rises, we have something to stand on and to stand tall in Jesus Christ. Now, some people have trouble with this idea of God and him and his judgment, and him being like a, a, a great fire, but only the fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the, enemy of, the enemies of God. I, I want to tell you this morning, God is God, and God does not change. God just doesn't get mad at somebody like uh, human beings may. It, it's not just an emotion. 
But God is God, and he's a God of fire. And that fire can purify us. He purifies us from sin. Uh, but there's, there's also the judgment side of God. If you think of a physical fire, I thought about trying to get a fire pot in here, but when we looked into it, it cost too much money, and I didn't have enough money, you don't have enough money, and the church didn't have enough money, so you're going to have to use your imagination this morning. But when you relate to fire, it depends how you relate to it, to whether it's mercy or judgment. You know, you can walk up to a fire on a cold day and you can warm yourself by the fire and it's grace. You can take a toasted marshmallow by a campfire, but not a toasted one, you can take a marshmallow and put it on a stick and put it in the fire and the fire will toast it for you. Or a hot dog or, a, you know, you can put a grate over it and put a pot on it. And as long as the fire is controlled and you treat it properly, it's grace, but that exact same fire, if you don't respect it and you stick your hand in it, it's going to burn you. If you stick something consumable in there and you're not careful, if something else catches fire and a whole mountainside can be set on fire. People's homes can be destroyed by fire because it's gotten out of control. It, it, it was not contained. It was not related to in the right way. And that's the way it is with God. God is God. And when we recognize God as God, we receive mercy. When we look to him and we say, you're a good, good father, and you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins, I'm a sinner and you are holy. And so I come to you and I confess my sins and I repent of my sins and I turn from my sins and I receive the grace of Jesus Christ. The fire of God is grace and mercy. But when we lift our voice and when we lift up our attitude and we lift up uh, rebellion against God, God is a consuming fire, a God of judgment. It's not that God has changed, it's the way that we respond to God. And this is what the Hebrew writer is talking to. We need to resist sin. And if you're going to hold sin to your heart and you're going to live in continual, rebellious, known habitual, willful sin, you will face the judgment of God. And it's not because God is mad at you, it's just who God is and the way that you relate it to him as a consuming fire. And then we are to endure hardship, just as these early Christians did. In Hebrews 10, 32, it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in facing in the face of suffering. Stand tall and endure hardship. As American Christians in the 21st century, we have had it too good, we've had it too soft, and we have not had the relationship with God even as the church as we ought to have. And so as our faith and our Christianity and our values become less popular, there may be people that mock you. There may be people that, that argue with you. There may be people that, that will persecute you physically. And there may be a time when our own government will put us in prison and abuse us and confiscate property. Who knows what the... Uh, that's not a prophecy. I'm just saying it can happen if we keep going down the road that we are going. And so we need to prepare ourselves to endure hardship and to persevere. In Hebrews 10, 36, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. I've been amazed at a pa as a pastor. I I've 42 years pastoring a church, and I'm amazed sometimes what little picayune things will get some people to leave the church. They just don't get their own way. They don't like something, and they're out the door. And we need to persevere. We need to hang in there, and we need to do the will of God. Well, the question is, what is the will of God? Well, God doesn't leave those kinds of questions unanswered. Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love your neighbor. In Matthew 27, verses, or 22, verses 37 to 40, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Jesus re replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two 
commandments. In the midst of all the disrespect for police officers, the church needs to be love. In the midst of the racial, and I hate to use that term, I should say uh, ethnic differences. There's only one race. To call a human being anything other than a human race is, is not true. There's only one race. Everyone traces their roots to Adam and Eve, and they were created in the image of God. No matter who we are, no matter what skin tone we have, where we were born, what language we speak, we are all human. We have different ethnicities within the human race. But when, when we live in the kind of ethnic turmoil that we live in our world today, and especially in our country, we need to show the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm trying to preach this morning, but I heard a sermon last Sunday on this very topic that I can't match. So I'm going to show you just less than a minute of the message. Pastor Mike Hilson, uh, down in southern Maryland, outside of D.C., uh, he went to the church where he is back in about 98 or 99, and uh, they had a church of about 180 people. Now they have multiple churches all over the area. They've, they're reaching thousands of people. And he preached that, a message last Sunday on this theme of racial, racial, uh, racial reconciliation as, as well as respect for law and authority in his church. And my wife and I were able to be here, there to hear it. And all the churches, they have several churches, and each church has their own pastor, but they work on their sermons together. And uh, they interrupted the sermon series and preached this message. I want you to just get a little taste of what Pastor Hilson shared last Sunday morning. All right, but listen, there is a power in the presence of the Holy Spirit that is real, and there is a power in the presence of the Holy Spirit that must be brought to bear in our lives and in the world around us. The Holy Spirit does what is supernatural, and we've been fighting it for so long because we are more afraid of being seen as weird by the world than we are interested in being empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, and I'm here to tell you God intended for us to be weird. He called us a peculiar people. We are made to be odd. You know why we're odd? Because we actually believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe God can do things that in the world's eyes are impossible. We look at the impossible and we see only an opportunity for a miracle. We look at the hopeless and we see the hope of Christ in it. We look at what can't happen and we wonder how God's going to make it happen because we believe in a God that is able to do what we can't even imagine is possible. Now, you're going to notice that, the, that, that there's more lines to fill in on your note guide, but I'm going to just skip over those right now and, and move on, and I'll include uh, some of those stories from Hebrews 11 last week. Pastor Kyle Ray, and I'm, I'm drawing it to a close now, and in a few minutes the children are going to be coming in with us. They're already waiting out there. Uh, pastor Kyle Ray actually filled the pulpit, became the pastor of the church, that our new general superintendent was part of about uh, maybe five, six years ago. Our general superintendent had pastored that church for 30-some years. He felt called and was asked to become the uh, president of Wesley Seminary, a new Wesleyan seminary in Indiana, and he did that for five or six years. Now he's been elected as our general superintendent. But the pastor that took his church was, was a person in that church who came into the church as a layman. He's a black man, and he was a businessman, well-educated, and he felt called to the ministry, and so he went through the ordination process, became an ordained minister, and as God was doing a work in uh, Dr. Schmidt for him to move and, uh, to Indiana, God was doing a work in Kyle Ray's heart that he was calling him to be the pastor of the church there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, Dr. Schmidt quotes him uh, a prayer that he prayed. And, and this is what he said. Thank you for giving the church a real opportunity to step up and show the world some optimistic action rather than pessimistic despair. Help us to actually do what we say we believe. Make us into world changers. Amen. It's time. 
it's time, it's past time for the church of Jesus Christ to get real. It's time for the church to show the world the way of love. The question came to Jesus, what is the greatest command? He said to love the Lord your God with with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And if, if the church of Jesus Christ cannot set the pattern of loving one another, how can we expect the world to love one another? We need to love the young, we need to love the old. We need to love people of color. We need to love people who are Caucasian. We need to love people that were born in this country and people that were not born in this country. We need to love people that are in this congregation. We need to love people that are out in our community. We need to be people of love, filled with love for Jesus and love for one another. And so in closing this morning, I'm going to take just a brief moment and offer the, an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And then we are going to pray together a closing prayer. Is there anyone here today that perhaps you came here and you have never asked Jesus to be your Savior? I want to pray with you. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to raise your hand. But I'm going to pray a prayer of confession and repentance, asking Jesus to forgive sin and to be your Savior. And if you will do that, Right now, this morning, you can leave this place knowing that your sins are forgiven and that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Jesus, I come to you this morning recognizing that I'm a sinner born in sin. I confess to you not only that I am a sinner, but I confess to you my sins, the sins that I've committed. And Lord, I recognize that I cannot save myself, the church cannot save me, my family cannot save me, good works cannot save me, no amount of money can save me, only the blood of Jesus Christ can save me. And so this morning, I repent, I turn, I turn around, I turn away from my sin, I turn to you, and I ask you, dear Jesus, to be my savior, to forgive my sins, And I make a choice this morning that from this day forward for the rest of my life, I choose to follow Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would bless each one who has prayed that prayer and that they would truly know sins forgiven, know the grace of God in their lives. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to walk and follow after you.